Here at the fake Britain house, we'll reveal the fakes that are flooding the market, conning people like you and me, and making money for the criminals. We'll investigate the fraudsters who are selling us something that isn't real and could be dangerous. And we'll help you avoid falling for a fake. Today on Fake Britain, the fake clothing banks that are fleecing kind-hearted Brits. A fake bank is one that is depriving the poor and the needy throughout the globe. The fake identity cards that could lead to a construction site catastrophe. Fake cards by changing hands between three and five hundred pounds. And the fake steam mop that could give you a real shock. It will short out components, electric shock risk, fire risk, explosion risk. Giving away old clothes to charity can make a real difference. A hundred million pounds each year goes to worthy causes because the clothes we're happy to give away are valuable. But the fakers know that too, and they're desperate to get their hands on the stuff we want to go to a charity. So, do you know where your gift of clothes could end up? We've all seen clothing banks like this. You'll find them on the high street or at an out-of-town shopping centre. In total, there are over 14,000 across the UK, and more than half of the estimated 540,000 tonnes of clothing we recycle annually are collected through these banks. The clothing is then sold overseas. Ghana and Pakistan are two of the most popular destinations, and the profits are used to fund charitable projects, both here and abroad. Ravi Zucci works at Planet Aid UK, a large not-for-profit organisation which owns nearly 1,500 clothing banks across the UK. The youth textile business is massive. There are many, many thousands of tonnes of used clothes, used shoes collected every month uh, from thousands of collection banks. And it's surprising how valuable our unwanted clothing is. We collect 120 tonnes of textiles uh, each month, and the value of that is approximately 600 to 700 pounds per tonne. A large clothing bank on a busy site will typically be filled within a week, and the clothes donated in that time can be sold for 200 pounds. Over the course of a year, that's 10,000 pounds. Planet Aid manage the clothing bank sites for a number of local councils, including seven locations here in Harlow, Essex. However, the property team at Harlow Council have received a report from a local shopkeeper about some mysterious clothing banks which have suddenly appeared overnight. Joe McGill from Harlow Council's property team believes these clothing banks are fake. As you can see, this is one of the fake clothing banks that we've identified in Harlow. There are six in total at present and we're looking to have them removed from the area. Joe and his team have been unable to find a registered charity using this exact slogan and logo design. Unlike other charities, where the council understands where all the clothing is going and the public know which charity they're contributing to, no one knows where this clothing will end up. The fakers have used the Kids Go Green logo, not to be confused with any organisation using a similar name, on all six of the bins placed around Harlow. The council has taken action and issued notices, ordering the banks to be removed within three weeks under the threat of seizure. But Joe's had a report that his notice has been removed from at least one of the banks. The bin's located behind the side wall on an alleyway and just sat around the corner away from the CCTV camera. Joe's suspicions have been confirmed. The fakers have swiped the notice. There's another fake. And his next stop brings him to a busy thoroughfare where the fake has been brazenly placed next to two genuine banks and is now causing a health hazard. This one, as you can see, is uncontrolled. They don't clear it up, they don't keep it tidy. We, we do not have an, any idea who actually owns this particular bin either. And it's got the same logo as uh, the one at Sherrod's Hatch and all the other ones that have been placed in Harlow. As for the state of the site, Joe's going to have to get someone down here, creating further costs for a hard-pressed local council. Joe also picks up some useful information on when the banks are being emptied. 
Have you seen anybody coming up to the banks or anything? The vans turn up around quarter to six, ten to six, when I'm out walking the dog in the morning. They'll come up, they'll empty the, uh, the clothes bank, fill up their vans up and go. But this problem stretches far beyond Harlow. Unfortunately, it's not the first time that we've heard of fake clothing banks. We've had reports of fake clothing banks over the years in many, many locations. Um, way up in Scotland and then down in Yorkshire. We've had many reports in, in Warwickshire and even in our hometown of, of Corby. Back in Harlow, another fake clothing bank has been identified. This time it's been placed on land owned by Tesco. However, the site is managed by one of the biggest charities in Britain, Oxfam. The charity have issued a notice of intent to seize the bank. But members of the public are still mistaking the fake bank for the real thing. Well, I just think it's very good because I would have put the stuff in there. I wouldn't have noticed any difference. Oxfam's Andrew Horton has come down to put a stop to this. The fake bank has been placed next to Oxfam's genuine banks. So what are the signs the clothing bank you use is the real deal? Just take a second to look at the bank that is in front of you. It's got a recognised charity. If you've got doubts if it's a charity, look on the Charity Commission website when you get home. Make sure it's registered with them. Has it got the right sort of labels on to warn you about what happens if you get into the bank or trap your finger? And has it got a number saying what the registered charity is? And if you've got any questions, give us a ring. Instead of the public giving goods to charity, which is what they want to do with their waste material, they're actually giving it into the pockets of whoever is operating this bin. So we're going to do something about it today. But this fake won't be fooling anyone else. Oxfam have arranged for the bank to be seized. It's going to be taken away to our site, will be held for another 14 days. So if the operator wants to come and collect their road bank, they're welcome to do so, but we might ask them a few difficult questions. We'll then open the bank if they don't turn up, we'll sell the goods for Oxfam's charitable purpose, and then we'll destroy the bank so it doesn't appear on a Tesco site again. Oxfam may have recovered the fake bank on their site, but the day before Harlow Council are due to seize the fake banks on their sites, four of the six banks disappear. Joe McGill is not happy. Whoever's behind this uh, deception of placing the fake clothing banks in Harlow has literally no regard for the public of Harlow nor do they have any regard for the money they're taking away from the charities and those charities who the council supports. For Ravi at Planet Aid, the real victims here are the vulnerable people who depend on the money raised by clothes donations. Every item of clothing, every kilo of clothing that goes into a fake bank and rather than into a legitimate clothes collecting bank is one that is depriving the poor and the needy throughout the globe. Fancy dress is fun, and if you're a parent, no doubt at some stage, you've picked up an off-the-peg outfit for your kids. They can be fantastic. Look, lots of little girls would love to be the princess at the party in this dress, but this dress isn't the one that dreams are made of. Quite the opposite, because it's a fake, and wearing it could put your child's life at risk. We spend over a quarter of a million pounds every year on fancy dress. There's an incredible range of costumes available. Pirates, nurses, historical characters, sailors, Disney princesses, even neon gorillas. Dressing up is a much loved British pastime, enjoyed across the country by children and the young at heart. But the fakers know there are profits to be made from make-believe and now fake fancy dress costumes are flooding into the country. Yeah. Jodie Frisby has two young daughters who love to dress up. Her youngest daughter, Katie May, had her heart set on an Elsa dress from the hit Disney cartoon, Frozen. Every little girl wants something for Christmas and that was her main thing and I just wanted to make her happy so I searched wherever I could really to get one that was A, top quality and B, not massively expensive. Jodie went online and found a dress that she thought would be perfect. So I was quite impressed with it, to be honest, for the price that I saw it for. Two weeks later, the package arrived. When it first arrived, I was here to get the post. I opened it up, I was squealing. 
I was so excited when I got it, because I knew Kate May would love it. It did look top top quality when it was all wrapped up, you know, I was really dead pleased with the dress. And Katie May was delighted with her gift. Kate May was really, really excited to see the dress. She screamed, she wanted it on there and then. So we opened it up and put it on and she was quite happy, dancing around the living room, doing a little Elsa poses, singing Let It Go. She was in her element. But it wasn't long before Jodie realised that Katie May's new dress wasn't everything it claimed to be. Three hours later, the dress started to fall apart at the seams. Um, it started to come apart in two halves. It was the bottom half of the skirt, and then the top half was like the T-shirt and the cape. It frayed pretty badly. It took a lot to get it sewed back together the first time it fell apart. It's fell apart twice more since then. It's been sewn up a couple of times, but the last time was it was literally in two halves. Fake Britain sent the dress to Disney. They confirmed it was a fake. But the fakers aren't just targeting children's costumes. Adult fancy dress is also being faked, and it's costing some British fancy dress companies millions. Morning, say that. Ray Peckett is managing director at Smithies, one of the UK's largest manufacturers of fancy dress. These costumes don't just suddenly appear. We employ 30 odd people who are just designing and getting the product to market. The counterfeiters and fakers just nip in, steal our product, make out that it's their product, and do the job for nothing. They're jeopardizing the jobs of our designers. We are one of the only people in the world that actually designs our costumes from scratch, and these people's jobs are being jeopardized because their work is just being stolen. Desperate to safeguard his workers and his company, Ray has asked the authorities to act, and they have. Right, here's our latest seizure. One of the biggest to date, the pirate costume. These costumes are just part of a haul of 3,000 fakes. Copying on this scale is damaging the company's profitability. The turnover, we figure that they're costing us is about 10% of our business. So you're talking six million pound a year, year in, year out. The fakers have attempted to reproduce every detail of the genuine product. So we've got two pirate costumes here. On the right, we've got the genuine Smithy pirate, and on the left, we've got the counterfeit. They've scanned our packaging. They've reproduced it, it, it identically to ours. The quality of printing is a little bit different, but to the consumer, this one looks like a Smithy product. The reason we know it's not originally was that the insert card, the packaging, doesn't actually fit. But it's not just the packaging that's being faked. Not only have they copied the packaging, they've actually copied our sewing label and care instructions. So there we go. To all intents and purposes, this is a Smithy product. Ray decided to take matters into his own hands. To find out more about the criminals behind the fakery of his product, one of his team travelled to China and posed as a businessman looking to buy counterfeit costumes. We actually were invited inside, and here we are um, being shown a Disney dress. Um, the entire showroom is filled with knockoffs. The whole thing is selling fakes. That's all they do. There's the, uh, the guys who run the factory. Uh, there's all the samples that are offered to us. And basically, we could have anybody's product in any packaging we like. That's all they do is counterfeit. They mentioned they were having a bit of trouble with Smithies, that Smithies has been putting some pressure on them. So, yeah, we are actually making some effect with these people. But the fakers were less than impressed by Ray's undercover work. They have an attitude that um, is appalling. I mean, they have actually threatened uh, some of my staff. You know, they, uh, they've gone into gory details of what would happen to them and their parents uh, if they continue pursuing them. The fakers have also targeted the children's costume market. This fake product is being sold online using the marketing image of a real Smithies costume. The two products you've got here, one is the genuine Smithy product, which has been tested for heavy metals, uh, nasty dyes and things which are quite bad for the consumer, especially for kids to have. Here, having assumed that they were getting this, what turns up is this. As well as the damage to his business, Ray's concerned about the safety of the fake children's costumes. 
Okay, we've got the two costumes laid out here. Um, what the consumer would have been expecting is this one here, which is the Smithy item. Comes with a mop cap, long sleeves, the uh, apron attached, and a, a nice collar with sleeves with uh, frills on. What the knockoff fake item is, is actually like a, a long t shirt. Uh, <laughs> but it's got short sleeves and uh, a roll neck collar. Well, it's another t shirt, probably made of. It's, it's a very cheap synthetic. It probably burns like the clappers. Children's fancy dress clothes aren't subject to flammability testing, although some retailers are insisting on safety standards for what they stock. The change came after TV presenter Claudia Winkleman led a campaign. Her daughter was badly burned in a Halloween costume. Responsible manufacturers like Smithies have always ensured that their clothing is fire resistant. The concern is that the fakers are using cheap materials and dyes to maximise their profits, and these fake costumes could continue to be a fire hazard. Fake Britain decided to put this theory to the test. We asked fire safety officer Matthew Perrin to perform a test on a genuine Smithies costume to see how it would compare with a fake one. He begins with a genuine costume. But getting the material to actually catch light is easier said than done. On the fourth attempt, the tunic finally catches fire, but it quickly and safely self-extinguishes. This is how costumes made by responsible manufacturers should perform when they catch fire. Now it's time to test the fake Smithy's costume. It catches fire immediately and burns violently for well over two minutes, possibly because the fakers have used cheaper materials and dyes. We wanted to know if this was a one-off, so we decided to test a fake frozen dress seized by Nottingham Trading Standards. It's not long before the entire costume is engulfed by flames. The material's obviously adding to the, the fire itself, and the fire spreading through the material, right at the back of the dress. Matthew Perrin is concerned about the flammability of the material used in this fake dress. We showed footage of the test results to Jodie Frisby, who unwittingly purchased a fake dress online. Jodie is shocked by the dress's flammability. Yeah, the way the back bit goes up, that's the most shocking bit. It started off at the front and now the whole back's just gone. I don't think she'll be wearing that dress again. Yeah, I'm really shocked that my little daughter has been exposed to any sort of danger by wearing a fancy dress costume. You don't think that a fancy dress costume is going to cause your daughters any harm. As well as the familiar passport or driving licence, we're all getting used to using lots of IDs, perhaps for work, the gym, events, or, look, the rail card. But Faking IDs is big criminal business. Even the enforcement agencies whose task it is to crack down on the problem are surprised at what they discover the forgers are up to. Detective Carl Ede and his team at the National Crime Agency are at the forefront of cracking down on identity fraud, more specifically the faking of identity cards. For three years, Carl and his team were on the trail of a prolific network of identity card forgers. The operation's been ongoing for some time. Uh, we've identified numerous cells producing and distributing these documents. Their painstaking detective work culminated in raids where they uncovered fake ID factories, churning out passports, driving licenses, and other bogus identity documents in their thousands. It will normally be a room within someone's house, or it may have been a flat specifically purchased for that purpose. It normally consists of a room with computers, monitors. You will have various different types of printer, some quite standard, some quite specialist, like a card printer. The computers will be loaded with graphic software and photo imaging software. There'll be scanners, but from that room, they can uh, create thousands of IDs. The NCA team recently identified this man, Medi Krasniki, as a seller of fake identity cards. They knew he was operating around Turnpike Lane in North London. But to stop Krasniki, they'd need to find the man who was forging the fake ID cards he was selling. That would lead them to the fake ID factory. 
The criminals were careful to disguise the handovers, making it hard to catch them in the act. These cards were often concealed. Um, they were not handed directly over. They may be left on a shelf in a shop. But the NCA team were about to get their break. They followed Krasniki as he made his way across North London, eventually arriving at this fast food restaurant. Minutes later, the elusive forger of the fake IDs arrives and sits down next to him. Carl Ede's team were in position outside the building. All they needed to do now was patiently wait for the exchange of fake cards to happen between Krasniki and the ID card forger. Krasniki then stands. He picks up a, an empty tray from the same table, and in that small moment of the tray being picked up and moved, over 70 fake ID cards are handed over in an envelope and are placed in Krasniki's back pocket. The moment both men leave, the NCA officers race to arrest them. Krasniki was caught red-handed with the 70 fake ID cards. And when the team raided a property linked to his name, they found £12,000 in cash hidden behind the oven. At a flat belonging to the forger of the fake cards, Arsene Mechi, the NCA discovered one of the fake ID factories they'd been searching for. Amongst the materials needed to create fake passports, driving licenses and other ID documents, the officers found a type of card they'd never seen before. Initially, we were, I have to say, quite unaware of the requirement for the construction services cards. However, as we downloaded the databases, it was quite clear that this was a, a prominent area of their work. The forgers had realised that ID cards are now mandatory on the vast majority of construction sites across the country. They'd been selling fake ID cards to construction workers in their thousands. This is one of the construction skills certification scheme cards that were seized. This is a fake card which states that this gentleman is a construction site operative and that he is accredited to work on construction sites. Basic construction identity cards were sold for as little as £50, but other, more specialist fakes, like this one, can be sold for 500 This, again, another plastic card that's been created. Again, it will have been layered on the computer. This one is for engineering services skills card, which states that the registered holder of this card holds the construction qualifications listed on the reverse. On there, it states he's specialist in duct work, erector and duct work installer. Mechi and Krasniki eventually pleaded guilty to all charges. They were sentenced to six and a half years and five and a half years in prison, respectively. Mechi will be deported to his native Albania on the completion of his sentence. Many of the fake construction ID cards for which Mechi and Krasniki were responsible carried the logo CSCS, and that stands for Construction Skills Certification Scheme. It's the largest of the identity card schemes, and Graham Wren is the CEO. For a supervisor or site manager, the card is a really valuable tool in confirming the individual's identity, in confirming the qualifications they hold, Fake identity cards can allow workers to operate dangerous equipment without having had to pay for any training. Fake Britain asked CSCS to investigate the scale of the problem, so they ran a survey of construction site managers. The results showed fake cards were being used on one in five sites. But the authorities are fighting back. The Construction Industry Training Board has been tasked with tracking down the people using fake cards. Investigative officer Ian Sidney is the first port of call when a fake card is discovered. We have uncovered quite a black market uh, for fake cards in the construction industry, um, especially for some of the plant cards we've found, which again we know are changing hands between three and five hundred pounds. Ian has just discovered that a construction worker using a fake identity card has caused an accident. We've received a complaint from a health and safety advisor for a construction company uh, following an incident on one of their construction sites involving a forward tipping dumper being involved in an accident. As a result of the accident, they have checked on the card held by the driver and it, it would appear that the card he'd produced to them when he arrived on site was a fake card. Luckily, there was nobody injured, but there was some damage caused to property on the site. 
Ian needs to track down the man who's been using the fake card before he can cause any more damage. What we'll do this morning is we'll obviously attend his address, hopefully he'll be there, and we can then try and recover the fake card, but we have no powers of arrest, so we use the local police to, to use their powers of arrest, and if we then need to search the premises for evidence, they will use their powers to search his address and also to detain him. The team arrives at the address, but the suspect isn't there. Is there anybody by that name who lives here? No. No, Luca, no. Clearly, um, it's quite common that uh, subjects will give false addresses, false dates of birth, and even false names, especially if they're here as migrant workers with no rights to work. So it's quite a common thing that we do come across quite regularly. So the team calls the number on the fake card. I just need for you to confirm your address, because the address we've got on file is and you're not living at You was there. The lady says that you don't live there, but you're now telling me that she's called you and told you that we've been with the police. The suspect eventually provides the team with a second address. You're at that address now? OK. OK. All right. Well, thank you very much for your help. I'll see you shortly. Ian and the police arrive at the second address, and finally the suspect comes out to meet them. We're from the Construction to Training Board, they're fraud investigators, OK? Yeah. And we're looking to speak to you about a previous card that was issued to you, a CPCS card, OK? Uh, this, no. this one is a card that was issued to you, which you used on a building yeah, site. I keep it. OK. This card, we believe, is a fraudulent card. The suspect is arrested and handcuffed. His wallet is searched, and they find the fake card. This is the fake card, as you can see, it's got his picture on it. This is for a forward tipping dumper and a ride on roller. But it's a good result, we've got the, the fake card. The suspect's taken to the local police station for interview. An hour later, Ian gets an update from the custody sergeant. Our subject's now been interviewed, formally admitted his involvement in the offence and how he came to have possession of the uh, fake cards. As he had no previous convictions, he has been formally cautioned for the offence by the police, and that's a, an end of the criminal investigation. But cases like this are putting the construction industry under greater scrutiny. It's fakery that could ultimately lead to a serious accident. A new gadget to help get our homes really clean is selling by the lorry load. This is an electric steam mop. The makers claim that steam is a more efficient way to shift dirt and grime, and inevitably, that's why you can now buy one of these, the fake version, almost identical to the real thing. But spend your money on this, and you'll wish you'd stuck to a mop and bucket. Steam mops have never been in greater demand. There are nearly a dozen different types available, and this one, the Thane X5, has been sold to more than a million British households. Elish Barnett lives in Guernsey, 75 miles off the English coast. With her three young children, it's a busy household, and keeping the floors clean is a challenge. We're outdoors people with uh, lots of muddy shoes, and the mop seems the ideal solution for us to be able to help me to keep the house a little bit more orderly. Elish decided to go for the Thane X5, so called because it comes with five accessories. She called a couple of retailers, but was put off by the high delivery charges. The solution? Go online. I went for the online seller because they were offering a free service. The mop arrived a few days later and Elish couldn't wait to get it working. It all looked absolutely brilliant. It was um, professionally packed and everything looked absolutely perfect. You know, I was trying out all the attachments and it worked really well. It was fast and it had different speeds of steam. So I was ploughing through the mud in the house and uh, wiping down the walls and I was really, really pleased with it. But four weeks later, the mop suddenly stopped. Elish wanted answers, so she called Thane, who manufactured the mop. I said, please, can I send this product back and for you to fix it, otherwise I'll just have to throw it into the bin because I can't get hold of the online sellers. And they were absolutely brilliant. They 
said before you do send it to us take some photographs and we'll have a look at your mop so that's what I did and they came back to me straight away and said no it's not one of ours it's a fake product Mark Thurgood is Thane's managing director the company's X5 mop was launched back in 2011 but the fakers weren't far behind just after we launched the product, we started to see alternative listings on Amazon and eBay. So we brought some test products, did test purchases. Some of the products arrived, some of it didn't. And we started to see that the product wasn't original product. It was copy product, it was fake product. As well as copying the mop, the fakers have tried hard to replicate the branding. As you can see here from these two boxes, we've got the original and we've got the fake. They've copied not only the product, They've copied the marketing messages as well. So we've got the one to five uses of the product, and then the copy box, one to five uses of the product as well. And to Mark's frustration, the fakers are now bringing out spin-offs from his company's X5 brand. So our product is essentially a five-in-one product. Um, if you look online now, the fakers are marketing their products as 10-in-one, 12-in-one, 6-in-one, many, many different variations. They're distorting essentially the same marketing messages that we're putting out. Fake Britain wanted to investigate how safe the fake mops might be. We asked electrical safety expert Steve Kirtler to examine two of the fake mops that have been bought by unwitting customers. Steve starts by opening up a genuine mop. All of the electrical controls are well sealed inside a separate unit. And if there is any problems or faults from an electrical point of view, we've got fuse protection inside the electronic compartment. Now Steve opens up one of the returned fake mops. We can see there's clearly some moisture damage uh, occurred inside here from a, a leaky seal. And we also have some moisture damage on the surface of this circuit board, which, again, will short out components, electric shock risk, fire risk, um, explosion risk, typical problems and issues that we would expect to find inside a counterfeit unit. Steve also takes a look at the most recent version of the faked mop, the X10. The immediate omission inside this one is that there's no safety release if the pressure was to build up or there's no blockage. So it'll be interesting to see how this performs under test. Time for testing. And first up, the genuine mop. Steve blocks off its main water vent as he wants to see how the product would deal with this common fault. The steam should escape from the user via the emergency vent, leaving the internal electronics dry. So far, so good. Steve now runs the same test with the first fake mop. The fake doesn't vent at all and appears to be getting very hot. I wouldn't like to get my hand anywhere near that at the moment. That's going to be red hot. So the fault condition that we've created has caused the unit to overheat to the point where it's melted the casing. That's going to be extremely hot. You're waiting for it to heat up, to use it to steam something. Um, you go to pick it up, the case is clearly melted, you're going to get severely burnt um, and, you know, possibly plastic just stuck to your hand. It's exceeded the, the temperature limits in the product standard, um, so this is a non-compliant product. Now for the fake X10. This product has only one vent, so Steve tests it without any alterations. If you were to leave this on charge, would it vent safely? This doesn't look good. Hot water is leaking through the unit's body onto the internal, unprotected electronics. So clearly, it's failed on the fact that the design hasn't allowed the pressure to be released in a safe manner. Uh, what's actually happened is uh, there's a fracture of a pipe, and that's just allowed the water just to spray all over inside the unit. Whenever there's water and electricity, there's always a risk of electric shock or short circuit, which can cause fires. We showed the results of the tests on the fake mops to Elish. I just feel now the event's over, how lucky I was that I wasn't the one that uh, could have got electrocuted. And, um, yeah, it's worth going th 
through the proper manufacturers and getting the right one rather than uh, landing up with a fake product. Once upon a time, our first job could be a job for life. Now people might change careers a number of times throughout their lives for all sorts of reasons. One of the most successful areas in attracting career changes is counselling. There's a boom in the number of training courses offered, some of them online, and they aren't cheap. A typical two-year course costs over £5,000. So, with so many people keen to retrain, can you trust your tutor? Every year, nearly 10,000 people decide to change job and retrain as a counsellor. Those working in the industry say helping their clients through troubling issues and experiences is fulfilling work and provides long-term career prospects. For those seeking to become an accredited counsellor, completing a one-year course is the first step. This counselling course, taught at over 100 places across the country, can cost up to £9,000. Many students will sign up for the course part-time and attend over two or even three years. In picturesque St Austell, Jenny Reid was looking for a new career as a counsellor, but the cost of the fees was proving to be a real obstacle. I looked into doing a college course and it wasn't financially viable at the time. So continued with the work I was doing. One day at the supermarket where Jenny worked, a customer, Dr Jacqueline Crane, mentioned that she taught an accredited counselling course. Her fees were lower than the price Jenny had been quoted by her local college. We arranged a meeting. She seemed like a genuine lady, and the course and everything seemed genuine. Dr Crane's impressive counselling credentials were on show for everyone to see. I remember seeing a certificate in the house. And I was impressed that someone had worked so hard, got the qualifications. It inspired me to work hard. And the course started well. I put my all into it. Every course we were set, I'd do it to the best of my ability. A few months later, Dr Crane arranged a photo shoot to celebrate the group successfully completing their first year exams. But some of her students were becoming increasingly concerned about the quality of the teaching they were receiving. We seemed to be repeating a lot of what we had already learnt. We were going over it far too often. We weren't learning anything new. It's almost like she'd run out of things that she could really teach us. The night before their next set of exams, the students, keen to be as prepared as possible, looked up some past questions on the exam body's website. The following day, as they turned over their exam paper, the students were astonished to see exactly the same questions as those they'd seen the night before. Dr Crane claimed the exam board, the AQA, had sent her the wrong exam. But her students had lost trust. It got to a point where we all decided that it was not a good idea to do the exam. We were all too up in the air about everything. So we left and two of the girls went and spoke to the police. The two students, fearful they'd lost thousands of pounds on a fake course, went directly to speak to Detective Constable Steve White. On receiving the complaint, I made some phone calls. Uh, I called the AQA examination board to see if uh, a Professor Crane was indeed uh, a legitimate registered centre with them. They couldn't find any record of her being part of their uh, their group. It was enough for DC White to launch an investigation. He took statements from the other students on the course, including Jenny. After obtaining all the complaint statements, made a decision to uh, arrest Jackie Crane so that we could question her about the allegations and also to search her home address to look for evidence and documents relating to any offences that may have taken place. A haul of documents discovered by DC White would reveal the true credentials of Jacqueline Crane. Of the many documents we did seize from her house, this one perhaps interested me the most, because when I found it, I really believed that perhaps she was a doctor of psychology, and uh, she did have the qualifications that she said she'd had, because clearly it's a University of Plymouth certification, uh, signed and sealed by the relevant people. So I made inquiries with the University of Plymouth and they 
sent me a copy of a certificate that they had issued to Jacqueline Crane, which was a diploma of higher education for a course which they said she had attended in 2008 but had not completed. So what they told me to look out for was if you have a look in the bottom right-hand corner, there is a reference number. And that reference number is the reference number of each individual certificate that they issue. And the reference number is identical. So if you look carefully at the two documents, you can see that the Diploma of Higher Education has morphed into a PhD. The date has been changed and the accreditation by the British Psychological Society has been added. Jacqueline Crane had never been registered with the AQA, but she'd falsely reproduced the organisation's logo to convince her students the course they were paying for was real. Eventually, DC White had enough information to charge Jacqueline Crane, but before the court proceedings began, she produced a doctor's letter, stating she was neither physically nor mentally fit to attend court. It was only when DC White contacted Crane's GP that he discovered the letters, like her credentials and course, were fake. DC White's discovery of the fake letter meant Crane would not escape her day in court. Faced with overwhelming evidence, Jacqueline Crane eventually admitted her guilt. The judge sentenced her to 18 months in prison for fraud and other offences. But for most of Crane's students, the dream of becoming a counsellor is now over. Many spent their entire savings on what's turned out to be a fake course. In total, I think we would estimate that Jacqueline Crane has gained about £10,000 as a result of this counselling course. Jenny had been enrolled in Crane's fake course for just under a year, so she lost £800. Some of the group lost around £2,000. But the real cost of Jacqueline Crane's fakery hasn't been purely financial. As time has gone on, I've got less and less trusting of people. But Jenny's been able to cope with Crane's deception better than some of the members of the group. There are others in the group that are still coming to terms with the whole experience. Um, they may possibly be affected by it for the rest of their lives. That's all from Fake Britain. Goodbye.